Located in the northeastern Nile Delta, the city of Tanis was discovered by Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte and his explorers. The uncovering of the city also exposed a lost but dark chapter of ancient history that held the secret behind the collapse of many Bronze Age kingdoms as well as a menace that threatened the existence of ancient Egypt during the New Kingdom era. An enemy shrouded in mystery, the bane of many prospering ancient nations, the end of an era of history. Welcome to Nutty History. Today we are exploring one of the biggest mysteries of the ancient world. Who were the Sea People and why were they the scariest nemesis of the New Kingdom of Ancient Egypt? The Ancient Phantom Menace On his expedition to Egypt, Napoleon Bonaparte's explorers came across the remains of an ancient city that Greeks used to call Tanis that served as a seat of power for the 21st and 22nd dynasties. During the excavation in the 19th century, the archaeologists discovered an ominous writing from the 13th century BC that changed what we knew about ancient history forever. From the writings of the times of the pharaoh Manepta, we know that Egyptians called these menacing forces the people of the sea. Not only ancient Egypt, but the Hittites, the Mycenaeans, the Kissites, the Ugarites, and the Amorite states were afraid of these mysterious warriors. But who were they? And why were mighty Egyptians so wary of them? About 3,000 or so years ago, the world was changing. But this change wasn't gradual and accommodating, but a literal shakeup. Civilizations, settlements, kingdoms, and empires that once thrived, flourished, and mutually prospered across the Near East, Aegean, Anatolia, North Africa, the Caucasus, the Balkans, and the Eastern Mediterranean collapsed and vanished off the map. Historians call this period today the worst disaster in ancient history, and there are many factors that were the harbinger of the darkest era of antiquity. Droughts, floods, volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, the technological evolution of warfare, disruption in trade, and general system collapse across multiple sovereign nations have been considered some of the few possibilities that could have played a part in the Bronze Age collapse. But there was one certain factor partially responsible for it. The mysterious group of warriors sailed their way to the shore of these kingdoms and wreaked havoc, pretty much laying everything in the dust in their wake except one mighty empire that survived their brutal decades and long pain. Egypt. But it was no walk in the park. The Mycenaeans were perhaps the first to read the writings on the wall. They started building large citadels and fortified old settlements, a trend that was soon followed in Asia Minor in anticipation of imminent hostilities. Soon after, dozens of port cities in Syria and Cyprus ended up being destroyed. The Hittite Empire's capital, Hattusa, was wiped out in a single night, and the sun never rose again on the Hittites. And that was just the beginning. Troy was burned to the ground and never could reclaim its historical significance ever again. Despite their preparation, kings of Pelos, Chirins, and Mycenae saw their palaces demolished to dust one by one. What happened to the Ugarids is evident in a letter from the king of Ugarit to Cyprus. The Attack of the Boats Egypt was the then leading nation of the region and governed an empire that extended north through the Sinai up the Palestinian coast to Syria and south down the Nile into Nubia. The only threats to Egypt's prominence came from the Hittites of Anatolia or occasional incursions of tribes of Libya from the west. When Sheridan, a pirate tribe from the direction of Aegean Islands, arrived at the shores of Lower Egypt to launch an offensive against the Egyptian Delta, they were up against Ramses II in the year 1286 BC. Ramses II was relatively a new king in the fourth year of his rule, yet sporadic attacks from pirates and nomads were nothing out of the ordinary for the Egyptians. Ramses II was a capable commander and strategist as history remembers, and he dealt with the invaders rather easily and quickly. He not only defeated them, but integrated the surviving lot of them into the Egyptian army. Records indicate that this was the first attack of the so-called Sea People on Egyptian land. The Aswan Stele mentions Ramses II's victories, including the one against the ones who belonged to the Great Green, which was the Egyptian name for the Mediterranean. Based on the records drafted during Ramses II's sons and Merneptah's reign, it seems the early sea people were a coalition of five tribes, Shurton, Teresh, Luca, Shekelish, and Ekwesh. Egyptians also referred to them as northerners coming from all the lands. However, there is no concrete evidence found yet about this mysterious force of reckoning's origins. But from what we know about them through Egyptian accounts, it seems Egyptians knew where they came from. But if they wrote about it, that record is yet to be found. 
Ramses II's second encounter with the Sea People was during the conflict with the Hittites over control of Syria and the Great Battle of Kadesh. While Sheraton was fighting for the Egyptians, it's believed the Hittites also had mercenary contingents on their side called the Luca and Dardanians. The battle ended up being a stalemate, but on his return to Egypt, Ramses II popularized the story that it was a glorious victory for the Egyptians. The Egyptians and Hittites negotiated peace to achieve stability in the Near East, but the status quo was eventually shaken up. Ramses II led a long life ruling Egypt, but his lengthy reign was followed by a succession crisis, political confusion, and economic exhaustion that greatly damaged Egypt's stability. Meanwhile, the Sea People benefited from internal political issues of Hittites and brought the empire to its knees. In Greece, the Mycenaeans also became weaker and weaker due to constant infighting. This political instability, general economic decline, and bad environmental conditions turned the whole region into a heap of gunpowder ready to be lit. The Sea People were the light to ignite the destruction, but what prompted them to start the attack is a subject that remains open to debate. The Revenge of the Hittites? Ramses II's successor, Pharaoh Merneptah, saw Egypt facing a new threat in his fifth year of reign, where Libyans found new allies in a coalition of Sea People. This coalition was the biggest alliance of Sea People yet. Ekwish, Sheklish, the new resurgence of Sheridan, Luca, and Teresh, who all perhaps originated in coastal Anatolia and called themselves the Nine Bows. This time, Sea People were not incurring Egypt simply for raiding and pillaging, but it was a concerted effort to invade Egypt to claim lands and settle down. Merneptah was successful like his predecessor and Father Ramses II in fending off the first wave, despite the fact that Egypt was not as strong as it was under the rule of Ramses II. His records state that his armies vanquished 6,000 soldiers in the battle and took 9,000 soldiers as prisoners of war. As a gesture of his wrath towards the insolence of those who dared to challenge his authority, he either castrated the uncircumcised prisoners of war or removed the hands of all those circumcised. It's a cruel fact, but interestingly, it has helped to identify where the Sea People came from. For example, the Ekwesh prisoners lost their hands, which means they were circumcised, thus definitely making them not Greek. That's one more strike in the set of possibilities of where Sea People could have originated from. I know it's not a big reveal, but as Sherlock Holmes said, eliminate the impossible and whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Chiker, Teresh, and Wishesh most likely hail from the region that was known for a city called Walusa. But Walusa was the city's late Bronze Age name, and in the past it was known as Troy. Yes, the very Troy that is known for Helen, Achilles, and the Trojan horse. So there is a good chance that the Nine Bows were mostly remnants of Hittites going for a last huzzah against the Egyptians. Historians have also speculated that Denyan might be Danoi, Shekelis could be the ancient Sicilians, Sheraton could have come from Cyprus, and Ekwesh are conjectured to be from somewhere in the Aegean Sea, but mainland Greece is out of the equation because of the mercenaries missing some skin. Egypt's New Hope Merneptah was succeeded by his daughter Tushret, and Tushret's daughter married Sennacht, who founded the 20th dynasty. Their son was Ramses III, who ruled for almost the entirety of the first half of the 12th century BC, and was perhaps the pharaoh who had the decisive bout with the Sea People for the future of Egypt. During his predecessor's rule, the number of tribes in the confederation of the Sea People had increased. It's estimated that the more kingdoms of nations fell to the Sea People, the more people joined them as a last resort to still have some identity. Pharaoh Ramses III himself mentioned their impact on the ancient world when he heard about the fall of the Amaru Kingdom in present-day Syria and Lebanon. Ramses III must have witnessed a collapse of many kingdoms between 1177 BC and 1175 BC as the ancient dark set in with the end of the Mycenaean and Mitanni kingdoms, along with Hittites and Ugarites that were already gone. Hittitologist Trevor Bryce's study concluded that the invasions by the Sea People were not just military operations, but inspired large movements involving swaths of the population who wanted to relocate, shake up the system, and reorganize the world. Ramses III's records also mentioned that when Peleset and Chiquet arrived, they weren't just columns of soldiers, but they were accompanied by ox carts full of women, the elderly, and children. These inscriptions mention a total of three campaigns led by Ramses III against the Sea People in the 5th, 8th, and 12th years of his reign. The first attack was two-pronged, with Peleset attacking from the land and the Chiquer attacking from the sea. They were trying to divide the Egyptian army in two, but Ramses III saw their ploy and charged full strength at the Nile's mouth to deal with the naval threat first. He successfully trapped the enemy fleet in the delta, 
and after defeating them, turned to the land invasion, which was a lot easier to deal with afterwards. Three years later, the Sea People didn't learn from their mistakes and employed the same strategy once more. Despite the fact that a larger nine bows were involved in the second campaign, the result surprisingly didn't change for the better for the Sea People. In fact, when the land battle was over near Jehi, Ramses III scribes mentioned the capture of several tribal chiefs. Hadi, Amor, and Shasu are among the land peoples and the Chikar, Shurton of the Sea, Teresh of the Sea, and Peliset. Egypt Strikes Back It's difficult to say if the third campaign was a separate last attempt by the Sea People to make their grounds in ancient Egypt, or if it was the climax of the campaign that began four years ago. The papyrus Harris I, found behind the temple at Medinet Habu, mentions a counterattack by Ramses III. In his testimony, Ramses III started eliminating Denyans after invading their islands and burning down the camps of Chikar and Peliset. The Denyans were raiders associated with the Eastern Mediterranean Dark Ages. He captured the remaining Sheridans and the Rishesh to subjugate them and then ordered them to settle in Egypt after they accepted to title him the ruler of the Nine Bows. The Onomasticon Ameno, or Amamemipit, mentions Ramses III's son Ramses IV and Ramses VI helping the Peliset people to settle in the land of ancient Canaan, along with certain other tribes around 1100 BC. These people were most likely the ancestors of the ancient Philistia. Egypt survived the Sea People, but the state of constant war and invasions put a heavy toll on the Egyptian economy and politics. Egyptians had a reputation for being poor seamen and Ramses III had to line the shores with archers 24-7 to prevent the Sea People from gaining ground. The heavy cost of these battles slowly exhausted Egypt's treasury and contributed to the gradual decline of the Egyptian Empire in Asia. Now, it's believed that despite his success against enemies, Ramses III left a lot of people dissatisfied with his rule, resulting in a plot for his death. In the end, Egyptians won against their biggest enemies, but at what cost, given the gradual decline led to the end of native rule in Egypt? Thanks for watching Nutty History. We hope you enjoyed the video and please do share, like, subscribe and comment on how you would defend against the people of the sea.